name is Barbara Hartley. I'm the executive director of the Downtown Arts District. Welcome to tonight's virtual lecture with Patricia Cronin, Aphrodite and the Lure of Antiquity. Tonight's webinar is an extension of the Downtown Arts District's Pompeii programming. In May 2020, the Downtown Arts District went all in and executed the City Arts Pompeii takeover with six, six exhibitions all relating to the theme of Pompeii. The exhibits included Due Dal Italia featuring works from artists from Italy, Gianluca Foley and Consuelo Bellini, and Pompeii Reimagined, a jury exhibition with artworks inspired by classical art and a, with a contemporary twist. The Human Eruption, an installation for Pompeii Reimagined by Jameson Thompson Thomas, and an anti ex post by Richard Munster. Future Non-Existent by J. Joshua Garrick and Ancient Techniques in the Young Artist Gallery. To our, to our knowledge, City Arts was one of the first exhibitions to happen in Central Florida post-quarantine. We are very proud that we were able to accomplish a safe and enjoyable evening, and we're so grateful for the amazing artists who kept creating during the lockdown. Tonight's program is supported by the Orlando Science Center for the exhibition of Pompeii, the Immortal City, funded by Orange County government through the Arts and Cultural Affairs Program. I'd like to welcome Brendan Landman, the VP of Visitor Experience at the Orlando Science Center, who's going to tell us more about Pompeii, the Immortal City exhibition. But first, let's watch a quick video. Time is running out to see a piece of history today. Check out Pompeii, the immortal city before it leaves the Orlando Science Center. Witness the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Discover hundreds of artifacts from the ancient past. Get your tickets online now before it's gone. We'll see you there. Brandon, are you joining us? Hello, thank you so much for being here with us this evening and for supporting this amazing blockbuster grant that made the Pompeii exhibit possible. Oh no, thank you for having me. It was our pleasure. So tell us about the exhibit. How is it going and how can people learn more if they haven't seen it yet? Um, how long will it be up at oh, the Science Center? All great questions. Uh, <laughs> so I wanna encourage anyone who hasn't had a chance to come see the exhibit. It is on display at the Orlando Science Center until January 24th. So we only got this weekend and next weekend left to come and take the experience. We know you can't travel far. So, you know, the exciting part about what we've done is we sort of brought the world to Orlando and give you an opportunity to sort of take a vacation without actually leaving your backyard. Well, a little bit of leaving your backyard, but not too far. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the exciting aspect of the exhibit has been, especially for a science center and all the partnerships that we've, you know, gathered up to kind of talk about this experience, including the Downtown Arts District and City Arts, it's really about right, STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And what I think is really exciting about the exhibit experience on a couple of levels is it takes all those concepts and really shows you how all of that was being done 2000 years ago. And we're still utilizing a lot of it today from the science, the technology, the engineering, indoor plumbing existed 2000 years ago. It's nothing special, right? You know, <laughs> So like learning more about that and then the idea of Pompeii specifically being able to tie that thread together was really what drew us to the exhibit and why we really wanted to bring it to Orlando because it's such a cross-generational experience, right? Whether you learned about Pompeii when you were in middle school as part of just the standard world history curriculum, or you've actually gotten to visit and now it's in your backyard and you get to go see over a hundred artifacts that were taken directly from Pompeii and the museums in the Italian region. It's just a truly magnificent experience that we're excited to bring. Uh, we're one of three venues in the United States that got to do it. And uh, we really want as many people as safely as possible to come and take a look at the experience and really have an opportunity to step foot into the past and understand what their life was and how that life 2000 years ago is affecting us today. I, I had the chance to go to the opening and it really is amazing. So after seeing the actual exhibits or you know the ruins in Pompeii, um, I enjoyed getting 
to you here and read more about some of the details that you miss walking around the city. Um, you know, a lot of great artifacts and a lot of great stories. Um, it was uh, well done. And I hope um, those who haven't seen it will get a chance to go see it. I know it's been uh, unprecedented times with, uh, with COVID and the pandemic, and you all are being as safe as possible. Is there a way for people to see the exhibit virtually? Have, well, um, on, yes, sure. online, if you're interested in doing that, we can uh, work with you. Our education team has a whole virtual experience that is offered um, to take a look through that. Um, and then if you're wanting to stay even safer, uh, the weekdays are sort of the most uh, low trafficked time to come in and take a look at it. So I would also encourage you to look at the times um, if you want a smaller crowd sizes and that sort of thing, the weekdays are going to be your best bet. So again, I want to thank our, our, our county, Orange County government for, for sure. doing the Blockbuster Buster Grant, but also for doing something um, out of the box and inviting others to apply to tie into the Pompeii theme. Um, so obviously things changed. Um, it was supposed to happen earlier in the year. Yeah. And um, that I'm sure was challenging. Is there anything that you want to share in terms of that experience of getting the exhibit here? <laughs> Yeah, uh, we were supposed to have Pompeii during the summer run here in Orlando in 2020. Um, that all got delayed. That stopped shipment from Washington. Um, that ass had to go ask permission from the Italians to keep the artifacts longer. Um, it was an ordeal, um, but one totally worth doing. And I, my hat's off to everybody on the teams that made it work. Um, hats off to the Blockbuster Fund at or, uh, Orange County that took a swing and let us continue to bring this in. And I hats off to all of the partners. Every single cultural partner that was involved was still able to provide something um, of significance to help promote the opportunity to check out Pompeii. And I think what one of my favorite things was is that everybody kind of tied together and banded together on an opportunity and a topic to kind of rally the region a little bit and give us a little bit different focus. Um, well, so I will tell you that we love the challenge at City Arts <laughs> and the Downtown Arts District um, to be able to invite and pay artists to do something, um, you know, out of the box and to come up with different themes. Um, the exhibit that Jameson did um, was really amazing. She built a volcano in one of the rooms. And um, what she did is she was kind of showing um, her version of a volcano here, and it was a landfill that she saw in San Salsuma. I think that's how you say it. Um, so it was really fascinating. She could see the beach. She walked, literally walked up to the top of this landfill and uh, <laughs> Smyrna Beach. So in her mind, she was thinking, wow, if we have, you know, a bad hurricane, like all that's going to get dumped into the ocean. Um, wow. So that was, that was her installation. But so, so many, um, great creative installations and artworks, 3D, 2D came out of it. So again, thank you yeah. for the opportunity. Is there yeah. anything else you wanna share? I know tickets are still available and people can see the exhibit in person until the 24th. Yes, all of that, please come check it out. Check it out online, um, get your tickets. And I hope everybody enjoys the program tonight. We were, it, it's been a pleasure working with everyone. So thank you so much. Well, we are so thrilled and thank you. I'm so looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker, Patricia Cronin. Um, we were hoping to get her here in person, but of course the pandemic um, precluded us from doing that. We um, tried and looked over the time and you know there wasn't really a window that worked right. in light of um, what's happening, but um, we are thrilled to have her here with us. Um, so I am going to introduce her. Thank you for being with us and we're gonna go ahead and um, move on with the program. So we'll much. see you in the Science Center. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, um, Patricia Cronin. She is an interdisciplinary a conceptual artist whose paintings, sculptures, and public art examine issues of gender, sexuality, so, and social justice. Cronin's work has been exhibited widely in the US and internationally, including New York, New Orleans, Ireland, Scotland, Italy, and so much more. We learned about Patricia's work when we visited the Tampa Museum of Art in Tampa, Florida. 
where she was the inaugural, the inaugural artist of their biannual conversations with the collection series um, that invited contemporary artists to respond to their antiquities collection. Cronin is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Rome Prize from the American Academy of Rome, Lewis Convert Tiffany Foundation Award, Anonymous Was a Woman Award, Civitella Ramieri Fellowship. Her work is also in per permanent collections of the National Gallery of Art and the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, both in Washington, D.C. and in Calvington Art Galleries and Museums, Glasgow, Scotland in the Perez Art Museum, Miami, Florida, and Tampa Museum of Art, Tampa, Florida, among others. She is a professor of art at Brooklyn College, D-U-N-Y. Now let's have a round of applause. Welcome, Patricia. Hello, Barbara. How are you? It's so good to be here with you tonight. Oh, we are well, thrilled. This, this has been a long time coming and I wish we could have done it in person. Me too, me too. I mean. <laughs> It would have been so much better to be down there, meet you in person and everyone else and actually see the Pompeii exhibition um, in person. I but but um, like you, I've been there also to, to Pompeii myself, but I, it would just have been nice to have that extra time to savor all the things that you might've overlooked when you're having your one day trip there. I agree. Well, you, you'll miss the exhibit here, but I know you'll make plenty of trips back to Italy and we hope you come to see us in Florida and get to meet some of our partners here. Oh, definitely, I hope so. So tell us a little bit more about your, your topic and uh, anything that I might have missed in the introduction. Oh, no, the introduction was, was <laughs> fun. And actually, I just wanted to, I mean, if I can just start, I wanna thank you and Ha Ani Hogan of City Arts and Downtown Arts District and also Brandon Lamin and the Orlando Science Center for inviting me to speak in conjunction with Pompeii, the Immortal City exhibition. And I am, again, deeply disappointed that I'm not able to meet you and see you um, there in person. But we celebrate the show and we gather tonight around the idea of how valuable it can be to understanding our contemporary life by examining our long ago human past. So um, I'm... I'm ready to go and share my screen whenever, whenever you think is a good time. Okay, I think Hani's behind the scenes, so let's take it away. Okay, Okay. Great. well, I'm so happy to be here tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. I don't know how many are listening or watching, but, um, but, but, but welcome and happy to have you with us. Um, I just wanted to start with a little introduction um, and it goes something like this. I love art history. I love the images, the forms, but I've often felt alienated by the patriarchal content. For much of this history, I wasn't the intended audience. And as we know, most art was created by men for predominantly male audiences. However, I do see myself and every artist, you know, as the descendant of all of these artists. And that history, you know, is ours. It's mine and it's our um, cultural inheritance. Art history is a malleable, or I see it this way, our history is a malleable breathing organism that has to be reevaluated, reinterpreted, and reimagined anew constantly. These images and forms are not dead, and they continue to still be viable, urgent vehicles for communication until everyone who wants to speak through them has the opportunity to. So for over 25 years, my aesthetic strategy has been to breathe new life into traditional art images and forms in time-honored artist materials and inject my specific contemporary political content into them. I subvert watercolor, oil paint, large readily made installations and monumental bronze and marble sculpture. Sometimes I even write books. I rely on the seduction of the familiar to then disrupt the viewer's expectations with content addressing issues of social justice, gender and representation. So tonight I'll discuss a few major projects that have been inspired by antiquity, specifically classical art from ancient Greece and Rome and neoclassical art and my interventions with them, which were brought together under one roof at the Tampa Museum of Art in an exhibition, Patricia Cronin and Aphrodite and the Lore of Antiquity. Um, it was from August, 2018 to January of 19. 
So in late 2016, the Tampa Museum of Art invited me to be the inaugural artist in this new biannual series they were going to do. Two collections, ancient Greek and Roman and contemporary art. And this was a great way for them to bridge their collections and their audiences. The invitation included a solo exhibition, a commissioned artwork in dialogue with an object in the collection and a catalog. I'm happy to say that the catalog is finally gonna be published at the end of this month. So we're finishing up all the um, fine details on that right now. But before I visited the museum, I didn't know which type of works in their antiquities collection, you know, would spark my imagination. My first trip down there, the first object I saw was this Aphro Aphrodite torso fragment, first century CE, common era. And I thought it was extraordinary. Through conversations and extensive research with the collection and with Dr. Seth Pevnik, who was at the time the chief curator and the curator of Greek and Roman art and 19th century photographs of completely botched, um, 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 what do you call them, um, um, restorations that were all wrong, um, but, but they were interesting and they intrigued me and they posed questions about authenticity and ownership as well as gender and worship in the ancient world. The life that an object leads long after the artist's death is terrifying to me as an artist to contemplate. For example, here's a drawing of a really bad 18th century restoration of the statue, this same statue. And this is Aphrodite holding a bow and arrow. Now those aren't even her, her attributes. I mean, maybe Eros her son, but never, never Aphrodite. A pomegranate, yes, a dolphin, yes, never a bow and arrow. So these are just follies of, of different centuries of restoration. Um, and then we have the head on the, um, on the right-hand side of the screen. Now this head ended up in Santa Barbara, but it's from the, the wrong century. And this was attached to that torso. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, they just, what happens to an object once it leaves the artist's, you know, um, control is, um, is, a little, is a little scary for, for the artist, at least. In this, sculpt, in this photograph, all the way in the back, if you can see my cursor circling, that's what she looked like in the 19th century in a really important British collection at Marbury Hall. Many of the works in this photograph were purchased by the Getty. My research for this exhibition included looking at you know, the actual history of Aphrodite, you know, the goddess of love and beauty, one of the 12 Olympiads, um, temples to Aphrodite throughout the Mediterranean, you know, the various sculptures of Aphrodite, but also the object file of this particular statue. Here's the sales record where they even say they're gonna break up the statue and sell the head separately from the torso. I'm gonna, I'm gonna underline it here, it's in pencil, and that nice old fashioned handwriting. The head is taken off period. It is good, but will be sold separate. And then they tell you who it's sold to and the dates and the prices and everything. Um, but luckily for us, the torso ended up, landed at the Tampa Museum. But the crazy patchwork of a life that this statue had inspired my kind of conceptual puzzle solving portion of my artistic practice, you know, and it was to imagine the head, to imagine and hand sculpt the missing parts that had disappeared from that actual stone torso along the way. So Aphrodite Reimagined is a 21st century, I'm just gonna start the video, 21st century ancient hybrid monumental cult statue of Aphrodite in cold cast marble and resin installed on the outdoor second floor Sullivan Terrace at the Tampa Museum. By using both op opaque materials stone to reference the Tampa Museum's ancient female torso and translucent materials, blue and green sea glass colored resin from my hand modeled head, arms, lower legs, flowing drapery and feet. Both aspects of Aphrodite become visibly unified. The celestial Aphrodite, Aphrodite called Aphrodite Oriania, representing transcendent principles and the common Aphrodite, who is the goddess of the people, Aphrodite Pademos, come together in this Aphrodite, goddess of Nixus, the mingling of specific and imagined bodies across centuries and continents. With the changing light throughout the day, Aphrodite reimagined transforms from a uniform whole into a more fractured appearance. This acts as a metaphor for our shifting certainties about history, what do we think is real? 
true? How does our understanding of history change as more research by scholars and discoveries from archeological excavations come to light almost on a daily basis? For example, I'm sure you all saw the news, I would say it was last week, at least within the last 10 days, about the frescoed fast food stall that was just discovered at, at Pompeii. I mean, they're still digging in Pompeii and making discoveries. When I finished sculpting the maquette, and this is the little version, and whenever you make sculpture, you always start with a small version, then usually a middle version, medium sized version, and then the full size one. But when I finished sculpting, you know, the maquette um, in January of 2018, I traveled to Rome as a visiting artist at the American Academy, where I'd already been a Rome Prize winner and subsequently a trustee. So yes, Barbara's right, I, I do um, go to Rome a lot and spend a lot of time in Italy as much as I possibly can. Um, but I went specifically this time to research the rich concentration of Aphrodite sculptures in the Roman museums. So in this um, screen, from left to right, we've got Aphrodite of Sidnus, second century CE, and it's at um, the uh, Museo Nazionale Palazzo Altems. And it's supposed to be the closest copy to the famous lost one by the greatest sculptor of the ancient world, Praxiteles. Um, uh, um, Pliny the Elder said that that, that, that that sculpture was novel because she was nude. And, and Rachel Kauser, the art historian, has said the history of the, of the nude for Western art starts with that Aphrodite. So many sculptors, many artists have been, writers and, art and sculptors have been kind of chasing this sculpture for a very long time and trying to replicate it. Of course, the original one is lost, but there are so many writings about it and also different um, people trying to recreate what Praxiteles had done. Um, all right, so after that one, then we've got the one at the Capitoline, um, which is just called the Capitoline Venus. Venus and Aphrodite, it's the Greek and Roman versions of the same God. So if a Roman artist copied the Greek sculpture, they would rename it the Roman sculpture because they you know, were the next you know, empire. Um, then we have the Aphrodite of Capua, which is down in Naples at the Archaeological Museum. And then all the way to the right, we have the Colonna Venus at the Vatican Museums. So these are just extraordinary, um, um, I would say, um, exhibits, you know, of human civil, of Western human civilization. Um, but I noticed when I was running around and made appointments to go see, some of these weren't on, on, on public view, I noticed some didactic wall labels that identified what was original and what was reconstructed. And that intrigued me. And when I got back to New York, I started experimenting with these paintings. And because Aphrodite is born from the sea, it made no sense to use oil paint. And since I'd never worked with acrylic paint before, I didn't know the rules. So I kind of created a new take on assemblage painting. And it was a fortuitous discovery that reflected on the interstitial space between the present and the past as well as the physical and the ethereal. So you can tell this is the one from the Vatican collection. Okay, so usually viewers, when they experience a painting, they only experience it from one position. When they move around from side to side, nothing changes in the painting. But these Aphrodite reimagined paintings consist of multiple layers of unstretched pieces of fabric, sheer canvas, sheer um, fabric, then canvas, and then plastic. And they're all removed from paintings traditional wooden stretcher supports, inviting viewers to walk around and see what is off register, the, layer, the off registered layering of different translucent, transparent and opaque materials and what they might reveal. The series problematizes painting by refusing to prioritize high art materials, the material of canvas and paint, the touch of the artist's hand and brush strokes over the common materials. Get it? Celestial, common, high art, common. Common materials such as the protective tarps and mechanically reproduced prints of the abstract paint residue from the painting process. These multi-layered paintings, uh, this is from uh, the Baths of Diocletian also in Rome. The head is missing, but she's um, washing her hair at the bath. Um, these multi-layered paintings challenge abstract and representational paintings, historical associations with image, recognition, chance, gesture, and aesthetic purity, meaning wholeness, with painted silhouettes of famous Aphrodite statues floating in a sea of blues, 
cerulean, cobalt, turquoise, and ultramarine that are layered over blue plastic tarps and covered with abstract paint traces that seep through the canvas while painting the silhouettes and then is baked into sheer fabric in the dye sublimation um, process. So just for example, obviously this is the blue tarp, right? We all know those from Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever you go. Under here, there was just one piece of artist canvas, right? Just to give you an idea. That's where the real Aphrodite is painted. And then the abstract parts on here are painted, I mean painted, they're baked onto this sheer fabric film. Sometimes it's silk, sometimes it's um, a kind of synthetic silk. They float like sails on a ship, hanging on the walls with grommets, which also reference the ancient port cities where the temples to Aphrodite existed. By obscuring Aphrodite, the layering complicates our access to her, putting the viewer in a position of someone searching for knowledge, for information, for history, hopefully the truth. All elusive, constantly changing, shifting, undulating. We keep searching, knowing that we may never have a clear answer. History is unfinished murky, hard to see, and get a firm grasp of. It will never be finished. These paintings reflect that and how necessary and complex it can be to look back. Obscuring our view is a comment on the impossibility of knowing. The ghosts of Aphrodite contrast with the opaque certainty of the stone sculptures, creating a visual rhyming of what is visible, what is veiled, what is solid, what is translucent, what is present and what is absent. Um, this is actually um, the Tampa torso. That's what that is. For centuries, human beings petitioned gods for help, protection and intervention. Supplicants worshiped gods and goddesses for safety, health, marriage, fertility, harvests, safe sea voyage, victory in battle. And here the water-based acrylic paint and the protective tarps, which today protect the things we value literally helped tell her stories. The ancient historian Pliny the Elder, who I mentioned earlier, described Praxiteles' famous Aphrodite, 350 BCE, as she who shines from ocean foam. And here, the sea foam sits on, top, on the top layer of sheer fabric like an apparition. These paintings posit an artistic interruption, an intervention in the past reading of these historic sculptures. By not pr prioritizing the artist's hand, by fully revealing the brush stroke and instead hiding it behind, below the abstract sea foam on commercially printed fabric, I'm pr also problematizing the myth of the great white male heterosexual artist. And with these paintings, I feel like I'm joining all those other sculptors and writing that allowed, allows me me to reevaluate historical approaches to statuary and to revisit and reinvent ideas about the human, the heroic, and the divine. And here I'll show you an installation from the exhibition. In these galleries, um, you'll, you'll see lots of different paintings that I've already shown you. Just give you a, a few sh um, ideas of what was happening in the show. What I really loved about it was they juxtaposed um, the actual torso, their ancient sculpture, in and around with my paintings, but then brought together for the first time the Santa Barbara head. This was the head that was attached to this body. And so that was just incredible. And he so here's you know, the head that was wrongly put on that torso. And there she is looking at um, the, the body she used to be attached to. And then my, my 21st century version of, 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 of the torso. And so they're all there together in a nice kind of um, triangle, which I love. And um, also you can see the um, maquette as well. And, and here we have, this is from, I said this before from the Baths of Diocletians, but I might've um, um, been, frozen and next to the Santa Barbara head. So I love that this one, there's a head missing. So obviously it's in another museum somewhere and she's washing her hair at the baths and here's the Santa Barbara head. And so they just did really great, very smart, considered, insightful um, um, curating with all of this. 
and they also included little, um, very small, delicate Etruscan and very and ancient little figurines of Aphrodite. And so I love the little figurines looking at the really large paintings. And if I hadn't spent a lot of time actually on that terrace and in these galleries, I never would have come up with the right scale and size um, for the works. And so that was really, really important. Now, one of the most works, well, I should say in the next galleries, the museum curated previous works of mine that were inspired also by antiquity. One of the works I'm the most known for is titled Memorial to a Marriage from 2002. And it's the first and still only marriage equality monument in the world. I addressed an untenable legal situation, the prohibition of of, of marriage, um, well, of gay marriage, and counterbalance the weight of the wedding that couldn't exist with the heaviest, most prestigious, and enduring artistic material, marble. Because in 2002, the only legal um, um, protections a homosexual couple could attain to simulate some of the 1,200 benefits of heterosexual marriage was to hire a lawyer to draw up wills, healthcare proxies, and power of attorney documents. Now, I had a sense of loss and longing for cultural rituals and civic inclusion. And since these depressing documents only reference our illness, incapacitation, and death, that led me to the natural site of mourning, the cemetery. So I made a three-ton marble mortuary sculpture, immortalizing myself and my then partner, now wife, the artist Deborah Cass, in a double portrait for our burial plot in Woodlawn Cemetery, on view through eternity. I used the 19th century patriotic form of American neoclassical sculpture to address what was, until 2013, a federal failure, not allowing gay Americans the basic human right of legal marriage. It was the most poetic political protest I could think of. Now, the history of sculpture, you know, basically is the history of death and memorialization up until like Brancusi. Um, prominent ruling couples have commissioned artists to sculpt their tombs, sepulchres, and sarcophagi since the beginning of time, from the Egyptians up through the 20th century. Um, some of this early work that influenced mine and inspired it, um, I thought I'd share with you tonight. So we've got the Etruscan. Um, sarcophagus of the spouses at the Villa Giulia in, in Rome. We've got the Tetanese sarcophagus with husband and wife at the MFA Boston. And I grew up on the North Shore and the South Shore of Boston. So the MFA Boston is kind of like my hometown museum. So I've just always loved this. Um, they've actually, they have two, they're, they're just extraordinary. Um, and then on the lower left is the sleeping hermaphrodite. It's an ancient sculpture. There's several versions the Louvre, the Vatican, and this one is particularly in the um, Galleria Borghese in Rome, and Bernini sculpted the mattress. And so there's a nice kind of intervention that he did with an ancient sculpture there. And then, um, obviously not a ruling um, family, but this is a 19th century William Henry Reinhardt um, neoclassical sculpture of two sleeping children. And so you can see how these all would have, um, you know, been rolling around in my brain when I was trying to figure out, you know, what what and what forms this particular project should, should take. But historically, it's the important men in the relationships that would have determined that the memorial and death equaled their importance in life, it was to be commissioned from artists of great skill. Rarely are female artists of any background um, selected to make monumental public art in any country. To simultaneously address the dearth of specific women in public, Sculpture, I purchased our burial plot at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx where um, Deb's mother and my father are both from to install the work. This both ensured our final resting place and a permanent home for my public art. Or as I tell my female artist friends, if you wanna make permanent public sculpture, you have to buy the land. And I'm sorry, but that is still a true statement in 2021. Now Woodlawn was designed as in 19, 1863 as America's peerless chaise. It's one of the best examples of 19th century garden cemetery movement. It's the resting place for many historic figures, artists and writers, civic leaders, entrepreneurs, great entertainers and jazz musicians, everyone from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, JP Morgan, Joseph Pulitzer, Madam CJ Walker, um, Cecilia Cruz and um, Herman Melville. Mausoleums designed by McKim Mead and White with Lewis Comfort Tiffany stained glass windows all from the heyday of the Robin Baron years of American history. 
basically the resting place of the powerful. So on the opening day, November 3rd, 2002, I kind of created a, a very performative um, day. I structured it like a funeral, a historic walking tour with was similar to a procession through a cemetery. The actual unveiling with an art historian discussing the sculpture was like a graveside service, followed by a reception in the Woolworth Chapel at the cemetery. And then close friends and family were invited back to our house for the rest of the evening. So this isn't just a static sculpture. I also replicated the rituals around death that human beings have practiced for centuries. That was in 2002, before gay marriage was legal in any state in the United States. And ever since, the response to the sculpture has been amazing. We're the third most visited plot in the cemetery. Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, and then us. They organize historic themed walking and trolley tours. There's the jazz tour, the architecture tour, the Victorian tour, the beautiful women of Woodlawn tour, which existed before the sculpture was there, and the veterans tour. And this statue is on every single one of them. Um, but while researching the history of sculpture to make that, because um, I'd never made a marble sculpture before, um, I stumbled across this extraordinary one. And I thought, oh, that's funny. I don't, I don't know this one. I looked at the bottom of the page and read the words Harriet Hosmer. And I thought, hmm, I'd never heard of her. And then I looked at it again and I went, wait a minute, why have I never heard of her? And then I knew she would be my next project. Um, everyone wants to see their reflection writ large in the culture. Often women and people of color are absent or, are so, or the reflections are so distorted that we don't recognize ourselves. With all my work, you'll see, I won't accept my absence, my erasure, a distortion of who I am, nor my omission. The world does seem very intolerant right now with systemic racism in fully exposed on full display and the reckoning has finally come. Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, Time's Up, and Black Trans Lives Matter rallies across the country. Although the Supreme Court overturned the Defense of Marriage Act in 2013, making the United States the 29th country in the world out of 195 countries, legally recognizing same-sex marriage, we mustn't forget that homosexuality is illegal and punishable up to death, still today in 27 countries. That leaves another 39, 139 countries doing I don't know what. So just I just wanted to put it out there. This is still a major international human rights issue. I moved the marble indoors in 2008 for different museum exhibitions and kept it inside um, ever since. I've replaced it with a bronze. And there are several bronze editions of different sizes on my way to making the full-size sculpture. And um, here it is in the Brooklyn Museum with their Rodin collection. It's been acquired by the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. And as um, Barbara uh, mentioned at the beginning, also at Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum in Glasgow, Scotland. At the Tampa Museum, they, they really, I think in a really nice way, um, uh, curated the very small first one. It's only nine inches long. Um, so it's that first maquette is always the most urgent and expressive. Um, so they paired that with an early Etruscan um, cinerary urn, which made me really think I really should make the, the urn part because um, that would be really fantastic. Um, so there's just all those nice, um, you know, conversations, you know, in, in time travel between, you know, ancient times and contemporary. Now this next image from the Tampa show also has a neoclassical bust looking at a wall of framed watercolors, which I wanna to explain to you now. Um, while contemplating my own death, I found somebody else's life, Harriet Hosmer, 1830 to 1908. And here she is pictured in the center. You are in her studio. This is the courtyard at her studio. This is her top of a big fountain, fountain of the Hylas that she made behind. So you might wonder, well, who are all these men? They work for her, they're her assistants. That's how much her you know, artistic production you know, could employ. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, she became known as the first professional female sculptor. She moved to Rome in 1852, apprenticed with the leading neoclassical sculptor, John Gibson, and soon hung out her own shingle. 
Hosmer lived within a lively Anglo-American expatriate community of writers and artists, as well as a circle of independent, meaning lesbian, and aristocratic British women. She was infamous in her time, had a prominent career, financially successful, critically acclaimed, and won prestigious commissions, exhibited in all the international exhibitions, like our Biennales today, and her neoclassical marble statues are in some of the best museum collections around the world, and yet she's largely unknown. So who gets written into history? Who is forgotten? Why, how, and what are the conditions in which eradication can occur? How is value determined? These elements all coalesce at the intersection of the ivory tower, meaning scholarship, and the art market, sales. And they intersect at the catalog resume, a critical scholarly archive of the complete artistic production of a single artist. It is the most prestigious book an artist can have written on him or her because it documents every work, every exhibition, publication, owner, collection, and location. When I started this project, I could count on two hands the number of catalog resumes on women artists in any language. And since an academic publisher wouldn't hire like a real PhD art historian to pay them a salary for five to 10 years that it normally takes to write, to research and write a catalog resume, I decided to do it for her. Now I'm not an art historian. You know, I say I just play one in my studio. I don't really know how to make a book yet, um, but I figured you, you got to start at the beginning and I knew I would need a book cover. So I made a book cover and then I realized, well, I'm going to need a title page, obviously. <laughs> well, and then there's like, well, you need a frontispiece. And, you know, usually if it's on an artist, you know, that artist's signature is right below the portrait. So I had to do that. But my catalog resume is made by hand because I wanted it to be legible that an art that it was left to an artist to do this. Otherwise, the institutional critique is lost. Each of her neoclassical marble statues are represented by a mon monochromatic watercolor. Because of the transparent properties of watercolor, gum arabic is the pigment binder. It's the perfect medium to represent the luminosity of marble, how light penetrates the surface of marble, swirls around an inch below before it bounces back out. Neoclassical artist subjects were literature, history, Greek mythology, and the Bible. This is Daphne, the actual marble bu bust by Hosmers in the Metropolitan Museum of Art Collection. This is one of the few bronzes she ever made, and it's the clasped hands of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, with whom she was very close friends in Italy. They actually used to sell a plaster knockoff of this at the Met gift shop next to the fake Degas bronze horse. So what I'm saying is I haven't gone back in history and back in time and found some random female artist. I liked her work and I think you should too. I'm saying I found the most famous female sculptor of the 19th century and frankly she's hidden in plain sight in the Met and their gift shop. This is just to give you an idea of um, the, her stature within this, this field. This is John Gibson, right, who she apprenticed with. This is Hosmer over here. This is her Zenobia statue. And this is the Prince of Wales visiting her, her um, studio in Rome. Now, with a bunch of other dignitaries. Lots of people in, in, the, in the 19th century, you know, wealthy merchants and the aristocrats would travel from their home countries and they would go to Rome. It was the place to go to. If we were going to elevate ourselves, especially Americans, we were still a young country. If we were going to elevate ourselves and become learned and, you know, um, um, sophisticated and part of, part of civilization, then we needed to, you know, learn from the ancients. And so when other wealthy people would travel um, from, from the United States, Boston, Philadelphia, you know, up and down the east, Eastern seaboard, um, they would go to Rome and what would they want to do? Well, not just take in the Colosseum and the Pantheon, they would also want to visit their, you know, countrymen and women and, you know, see them as being good examples of Americans abroad. So, and also, um, the Prince of Wales bought three of her works. And here is her tomb of Judith Falconet. So this is really interesting because it's the first piece of art by an American artist, male or female, permanently installed in a Roman church, Sant'Andrea della Frate, near the Spanish steps. 
Her brethren sculptors, as she called them, weren't threatened by the ladies patting their clay, as the men referred to them, until she started winning prestigious and lucrative mortuary commissions instead of them. That's when all the trouble begins, basically. <laughs> and um, I've written a whole book about it called The Zenobia Scandal, but we'll, we don't have to talk about that tonight. But also, as we know, subject position really matters. Hosmer isn't just making cookie cutter neoclassical works. When she does choose the same subjects as, as the men, she treats the form differently. Hosmer's Medusa is a good example, an alternative interpretation of the myth. Hosmer portrays Medusa not simply as beautiful, but sympathetic as well. Her head is tilted back. She's looking away, not directly at the viewer. We are watching her gaze, her most you know, famous you know, activity, right? She turns men to stone with that gaze. Well, while she's performing her most powerful activity, her chest and breasts are left vulnerable and exposed, meaning her lungs are still there and she's still breathing. Her shoulders are relaxed, her truncated arms and discreetly at her deltoids, slightly pushed back, pushing her chest forward towards the viewer, unguarded with a decorative knot of two snakes joined delicately under her breasts. Behind her undulating locks are two hidden wings that reference her most famous offspring, Pegasus. By, depe by depicting Medusa in her pre-decapitated state, her head firmly attached to her body, Hosmer stresses her humanity. This is not the hysterical, grotesque, you know, Baroque Bernini or Car Caravaggio's Medusa. It's a very different humane one. And here we have Beatrice Cenci, you know, that statue that I just fell in love with Hosmer. You know, here she is, she's in Castel San Angelo, the night before she's about to be executed, but she's at peace with her fate for killing her incestuous father. So we start to notice a theme, right? Heroines in dignified moments of resolve, right? Seem to be a theme that is very, that resonates with Hosmer. And then we have Zenobia, a third, the third century ruler of Palmyra, which is modern day Syria. And this is a great example of how Hosmer chooses different subjects than her male counterparts. They were, they were more inspired by the tragic story of Cleopatra who commits suicide when she's being conquered by the Roman emperor. Hosmer chose a different hero. Her queen, when captured by Rome, right, is marched through the streets as a war trophy. These chains were supposedly made of gold. They're about to kill her, but because she led, you know, conquered most of Asia Minor and Egypt, um, you know, she had diplomatic and, and military skill. She talks them out of it. She gets remarried, has five more children, and lives out the rest of her life peacefully and dies of natural causes in, outside of Tivoli, right? So that's who Hosmer picks as opposed to Cleopatra. You've seen 8 million paintings or sculptures of Cleopatra. I'm sure you've never even heard of Zenobia. So that's just a really nice little addition. And then here's the sleeping fawn an example of how Hosmer again steps outside the culturally normative behavior of what's acceptable for women at the time. The sensuality of the languorous, mostly nude. Remember, it's scandalous for women to be exposed to any nude models, male or female at this time. And it's counterbalanced by the devilish busy hands of the baby satyr playing a prank by tying, right? The drunk or sleeping uh, fawn you know, to the, to, to the tree stump that he's sleeping on. But most importantly, it's rumored to be a self-portrait. Now this is incredibly radical. Hosmer was only romantically linked to women her entire life and very much liked every royal woman she could get her hands on, including 25 years with Lady Ashburton of Scotland. But the biggest challenge was how to visually represent an object I couldn't see. One Hosmer statue, what the London Art Journal called Hosmer's crowning achievement, her masterpiece, which is now lost, the life-size marble statue of the last queen of Naples. Hosmer liked female subjects, sovereigns in particular, and the last queen of Naples was a real live monarch. She had a Bourbon queen. But the sculpture is lost and there is no visual documentation of it, only contradicting, contradicting written descriptions, some published um, you know, in magazines and some in personal letters written home to the U.S. by people on the grand tour. 
I grappled with this question for some time and just because the pieces are missing, I didn't want to leave the page blank in my catalog resume book that I was writing and illustrating. I had to give presence to her absence, not reinscribe her absence. And having made a three ton marble sculpture myself, I still don't know how you can lose something that big and heavy. <sighs> Um, I won the Rome Prize at the American Academy of Rome for specifically this project, which part of the fellowship is you live in Rome for a year. During that year, tracing Hosmer's footsteps, being surrounded by Catholicism, majestic opulent churches, mysticism, stories of miracles and saints' lives, shards of streaming light into churches helped me shape the answer, an apparition, a ghost image for a phantom sculpture, a missing statue. And then I realized it wasn't just one lost sculpture. It was a whole lost career. So I started making these ghost images and interspersed them with the watercolors of the statues. You know, ghost, statue, ghost, statue, ghost. And then she disappears. Another example of classical art intersecting with my contemporary artistic practice is Machines, Gods and Ghosts exhibition. I was honored to be the first contemporary artist ever invited to have a solo show at the Capitoline Museum's converted power plant, Centrale Montemartini Museo. Before the Tate Modern in London renovated their turbine hall, but unlike them, the Capitoline decided to leave the colossal diesel engines intact and installed their classical sculpture collection in and around this industrial archeology. span Into this evocative space, I interspersed Hosmer's ghost images. Now they're printed in that dye sublimation technique on monumental translucent silk panels that would slowly undulate, slowly moving, seeming to breathe, giving the statues a kind of interior life, as if something inside them had broken free of the restraints of their carefully controlled carved cold surfaces. The combination of industrial archaeology, complete with the smell of diesel fuel, classical sculptures, and contemporary art created this really interesting dialogue about memory and loss. And it was just very, very layered. And here I think the ghosts finally become what they were always supposed to be. And ultimately, it's the fullest expression of this, this body of work. The goal to give presence to absence and make solid and visible what isn't. And if you stand in just the right place at Centrale Monte Martini, you could swear the workers who labored in the power plant are out having lunch and will return any minute. I think about those nameless workers, also the anonymous Greek and Roman artists who carved those sculptures and Hosmer's past. Here at the Tampa Museum show, the curator placed two of the ghosts behind Hiram Powers' bust of the Greek slave, 1843. Now the full figure Greek slave of which there are several versions was the most famous American sculpture in the 19th century. Um, I don't have enough time to go into it, but rest assured, it was a subtle, cheeky curatorial move to have two ghosts of hired Hosmer slowly undulating in the air conditioning while the bust behind the bust in stone was motionless and encased in a plexiglass box. I just thought that was pretty genius, um, what the curator had done. Now, the last series I'm going to show you, it wasn't on view in Tampa, but it still is inspired by the ancient rituals of remembrance. In 2015, I was invited by the Italian curator Ludovico Pertesi, who had also curated that Centrale Monte Martini show, to participate in the Venice Biennale. And violence against women um, was really forefront in my mind at that point. And I focused on three um, horrific events and I just couldn't shake it. And so inside the 16th century of the Church of San Gallo, I created a shrine in their honor. I focused on Boko Haram kidnapping the Chibok um, schoolgirls, the gang rape and lynching of two teenage cousins in Uttar Pradesh, India, and the incarceration and forced labor institutions known as Magdalene Laundries in Ireland and other countries. I gathered hundreds of girls clothes from around the world, those three specific locations, and arranged them on three stone altars to act as relics for what I considered young gender martyrs. Part of every major religion's practice 
shrines provide a place for contemplation, petition, and rituals of remembrance. Inside the deconsecrated church, I used a light minimalist interventionist touch to remind us what we have in common is our shared humanity, flesh and bone, our bodies. By creating an installation with the remnants of what the missing body would have inhabited, the materiality of the fabric reminds us of who is missing and publicly acknowledges their suffering. Commemorating their spirit, this site-specific installation is a meditation on the incalculable loss of unrealized potential and the hopelessness in the face of unfathomable cruelty, juxtaposed against the obligation we have as citizens of the world to combat this prejudice. I attempt here to restore some dignity these women's and girls were denied in life. So on the high altar, I've arranged um, a pile of cotton and silk saris, lots of sequins, representing a specific event at a tiny village in Katra in, northern, in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. On May 27, 2014, two cousins, 14 and 15 year old Pushpa and Murti were raped and lynched. The police wanted to cut down their bodies from the mango tree and make it go away as quickly as possible. The villagers wouldn't let them in and uh, formed a silent protest because they wanted everyone to see what had been done to their children. And it was just enough time for a few people to take pictures with their cell phones and widely circulate them. Otherwise, we never would have learned what happened to this, the lowest caste. Begs the question, what else don't we know about? On the altar to the left, I arranged a pile of hijabs worn specifically by Muslim women in Africa to represent the students kidnapped from their government secondary school in the village of Chibok in the northern state of Borneo, Borno in Nigeria in 2014, April 14th and 15th, by the terrorist group Boko Haram, which sparked global outrage and inspired the hashtag bring back our girls. They were trafficked, sold, given as gifts. Some, were, some actually did escape and return to their village, although they were mistrusted by even their families because the families then thought they were Boko Haram now. 112 are still missing, of which journalists only believe three are still alive. And on the altar to the right is a huge pile of cotton, wool, and linen aprons symbolizing girls imprisoned in the Magdalene laundries. Forced labor institutions predominantly run by the Catholic Sisters of Mercy in Ireland, but also the UK, Germany, France, Italy, and even the United States. Any female minor that jeopardized a family's moral reputation, orphans, unwanted girls, the precocious, low mental capacity, unwed mothers, prostitutes were sent there. No specific crime was committed, no legal sentence with an end date. They were starved, deliberately not educated. They shaped their heads, they took away their names, they gave them numbers, sound familiar? And they worked from dawn till dusk doing laundry for the church, for the state, and for wealthy um, Irish families. And then their babies were sold to wealthy American families. The last one finally closed in Dublin as recently as 1996 with women who worked in those laundries still living there th since 2008. So although these piles of clothes aren't ancient or classical, right, as ready-mades, you know, the fabric, the drapery, how it folds, how it hangs, is a formal thread that, that appear, appearing consistently throughout history and my work. And the ritual of remembrance is in a sacred space is a constant human practice from ancient times to today. My collaborations with the Tampa Museum of Art Antiquities Collection broadened my understanding of the ancient world by trying to imagine what people there, specifically the women and men who would have worshiped Aphrodite, her cult statues at one of the many temples in the port cities would have petitioned her for and what those rituals were like. Through studying the collection, the Tampa Aphrodite, the small domestic ones, as well as my conversations with the curator, Seth Pevnik, and lots of reading and researching other Aphrodite sculptures in Rome, I came to have such a deeper appreciation, but also so many more questions about what was it about her that captivated ancient audiences, worshipers, and artists alike. It was important in the process to be able to spend time, you know, in those spaces to make sure I made everything not site specific, but, but really match the, um, 
the architecture. The site-specific installation of Aphrodite, oh wait, I wanna go back one more. Um, you know, adds power to that solemn, somewhat spiritual experience one could have on the terrace gallery. It's almost like a, it's like I made it so, I returned her to her cult statue scale and put her there. And it, it did have like a bit of a resonance of, of a temple. And then the one last work I made new for this um, exhibition, it was my first glass sculpture. Now they're, think of them as two halves of a scallop shell that Aphrodite's born from, right? They're about the size of a cinder block each, which is really hard in cast glass. And think about Botticelli's Birth of Venus, right? So they're cast glass of the packing foam from the Metropolitan Museum of Art's plaster replica of their Aphrodite statue. I bought it as a reference for when I was modeling the feet for my monumental Aphrodite. I a package arrived, took the statue out, out of the packing, looked at her, she looked good. And then I saw the vacuum packing foam and it was the perfect impression of her missing body. And I thought, this is really incredible because it's translucent glass it, and it's, it has this optical trick, it plays with you. It's concave and convex. Her body appears to be three-dimensional coming out to you in your space, in real life, when you're with the actual glass sculpture. And then, and then it flips back into being a void in empty space. She's missing and all we have is the negative space around her. And I just thought it was really conceptual and metaphoric poetic kind of gold. And I just, I just had to make it the minute I saw it. I began this conversation with the Tampa Museum a couple weeks before the 2016 US election. I was pretty despondent. And this project was an opportunity for me to go back in history to research where the segregation of the sexes and ensuing subjugation began. I went back to Sarah Pomeroy's goddesses, whores, wives, and slaves. Rachel Rosenzweig's Worshipping Aphrodite, Christine Condolian and Phoebe Siegel's Aphrodite and the Gods of Love, and Mary Beard's Women in Power. In a social political climate that's generally so hostile to women with real systemic structural misogyny, it has been a tonic to devote my attention to the history of cult worship of a female deity, a female authority in public space. I truly believe it's the artist's job to look out, see the world, hopefully keenly observe it, reflect, and then respond. Hopefully we expose some greater or hidden or overlooked truths about what is really going on, what it's really like to be here now. I think that's the artist's job. But also because she's the goddess of beauty, I needed to examine my relationship to beauty, a political or theoret theoretical relationship to beauty, which I'm still working on, I reread Elaine Scarry's On Beauty and Being Just, and I'm thinking about her in investigations into two definitions of the word fair, F-A-I-R. One is loveliness, loveliness of continence, countenance, and the other is equitable distribution. She thinks that beauty doesn't take us from, but in fact leads us to justice. And, uh, you know, that's all still rolling around in my head, which is why I have to keep making the paintings until I figure it out. You know, we want the same things as people from the ancient world. We want good health, a good marriage, fertility, food. We want a good harvest. We want fair legal contracts, safe travels, just government. For almost 30 years, I've had an unwavering commitment to gender equality as a central theme to my life's work. I've chosen unpopular subjects, manipulated unfashionable art forms. When I say unfashionable, I mean unfashionable to the contemporary art world and relied on the seduction of the familiar to encourage viewers to see these themes with fresh eyes and empathy. I strive for a delicate balance of conceptual rigor and visually engaging imagery and form to align with content that addresses some of the most pressing issues of our time, gender, sexuality, and equality. I continue to examine the place of women in the world, women in public, and believe exploring the past will continue to illuminate the present and forge a way forward. Thank you. Hello again, thank you so much.
That was such a powerful and thought provoking presentation. And I'm thrilled that I was able to see the exhibit when it was over in Tampa. So thank you for sharing and shedding more light on Aphrodite, the lore of antiquity. Um, we do have a few questions. And since we are kind of reaching um, our time limit, I'm going to select four. And a couple of them are um, have several parts to them. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first one. Okay. Um, you started tonight's talk with the warnings that this is what happens when artwork leaves the hands of the artist. In, in reference to the uh, misappropriated head and the body of Aphrodite sculpture, uh, could you share how this attitude informs your own practice? What is your relationship to art historian and art critics and uh, how have, have these extended perceptions of your work altered or affected your working concepts and methods? Oh boy, <laughs> uh, th that's a whole bunch of questions. We could do another hour on that. Um, but first I like to say, you know, some of my best friends are art historians and always have been. I have nothing but the utmost respect for them. Um, uh, yeah, I do, I mean, as somebody, you know, when you, when, as human beings, if we put a lot of effort into something, we 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 don't want it to just get thrown out in the trash you know we want we, especially when you develop your skills and your concept and your critical thinking skills and your artistic skills you you don't want it just lost um and that maria sophia um, um sculpture that hosmer made you know nobody can find it and i still have a couple ideas where it could be but basically you know it probably just got there you know there was a a sale you know, when, when, when your you know, great, great grand nieces inherited the castle in Bavaria, you know, and they couldn't afford it, they sold off the tapestries, they sold off the sculptures and, you know, three castles down the road bought it. And then it's been sitting out in the garden ever since, you know, deteriorating. So we don't know what happens to these things. It's a, it's a miracle. I mean, there is looting and there's all of that. That's a whole other story, but um, it's just terrifying to me you know, what could happen. I mean, what if someone comes and cuts off the heads of memorial, of the marble of memorial to a marriage and it ends up on another continent? I mean, there's all that dislocation when something's made site specifically. I'm sure I'm not answering because there were, I think there were 14 questions in that question. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat it? <laughs> yeah, could, could you? Uh, okay. Um, so you started tonight's talk with a warning of, this is what happens when an artwork leaves the hands of an artist. In reference, uh, to the misappropriated head of the body of the Aphrodite sculpture. Could you share how is this attitude, how has it informed your own practice? What is your relationship to the art historian and art critics? And how have these external perceptions um, affected your work? Mm. No, these are, these are really good questions. I mean, it does make you want to take very good care of your work. It, I mean, I'm not going to say it turns you into a control freak, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's complicated. Do you sell the work? What's going to happen to it? You have no control once it leaves your, um, you know, ownership, basically. I, yes. So yes, the marble is under lock and key. I can, I can confirm that. <laughs> um, but I have great relationships with art historians. Like I said, I mean, you, I mean, I'm often, it's, I'm, art historians often tell me I'm an art historian's artist, you know, so, so we get along pretty great. And because I have such wide ranging interests across centuries, you know, I just, I just, I don't want to say I collect them, but I cherish every new art historian that I meet that's working on something that I'm interested in. And, um, you know, and I, I just, yeah, I cherish those relationships because it really does inform my work. I mean, frankly, I think that's where so many of the best ideas are. Mm -hmm. you know, no one's making work in a vacuum, right? It's just impossible. If you're a living, breathing person, you go to school for art or you talk to other artists, you know, it's, it's, like, um, it's like being a novelist. Like, of course, you know the history of literature. I mean, you would, you would have to. Yes. Well, and it, and it definitely um, go, you know, goes along with the storytelling of, of your work. So I would imagine there's um, an expectation to have that understanding. Oh, can yes. Yes, I can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me move on to the second question. Um, many of your works are 
are um, in permanent collections of very established museums like the National Gallery of Art, the Perez Art Museum, et cetera. Can you explain how you developed relationships with those institutions and how they come to acquire your art? Mm. Um, different museums, different ways. Um, for example, a collector who owned the, the very large bronze of Memorial to a Marriage, as soon as he installed it, um, you know, at his, at his residence, turned to me and said, I feel terribly guilty. Not enough people are going to see this. I, I have to donate this to a museum. And so, and then started, and that person started, I mean, collectors know museum people. And so that's how, um, and, and frankly, given our economic situation and the tax benefits collectors get for donating work and how little money museums, even though every, they've all been expanding for the last 15 years, very little money gets set aside for acquisitions. So they rely on a lot of these donations. So it's not so much that I've developed a relationship with these institutions, it's that collectors, that their curators and their trustees know. Um, it, it, I, mo most of mine are through that channel. Um, although I do have a lot of curator friends, but they're in, because I'm an art historian's artist, they're in lots of different fields that don't collect, you know, departments that don't collect contemporary art. So um, there's that also. And then um, um, there's something else, because I, I, I like the, the question, you know, because it's something that a lot of people don't talk about. But also there's something about museums, you know, and I think there a lot more has to be done about, you know, the percentage of work that different museums own by people of color, by women, you know, and, you know, you can't have, you know, a $20 million Richard Serra sculpture count as one male artist and a little ephemera photograph by, let's say, Carolee Schneeman you know what I mean? Like you can't have yeah. the ephemera by the women and people of color and the monumental investment in, in the male artists. So there's a, there's a lot of, um, and then count them as equal. Oh, we've got 50, 50. That, that, what I just described is well, we've got one man and one woman. It's like, no, 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 not the same, not the same. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of conversation in, in how to have more equi equity in the collections and acquisitions. Yeah. Yeah. So question number three, and if, if you didn't see it already, Ha'ani put the questions in the chat so you can see them as well. Um, so with the advent of new technology and preservation efforts, uh, we have been able to reimagine classical marble sculpture uh, with its original polychrome uh, treatment, sometimes changing our understanding of those works and the context in which they were created. Will you, will you please speak to how color uh, would alter the tone of your sculptural work? I'm gonna say probably something really terrible. That, that painting on those sculptures horrifies me. <laughs> I know it's really terrible. I'm, I, I've been taught art history a, a certain way and I've developed you know, my palette and my vision in a very particular way that's usually more material based. So the inherent color of the materials is going to be what I'm really interested in. But I know when you see those origin, the, the renderings, or even when you can, I mean, because they are around, you can find them. Um, um, if, if you, I mean, used to travel um, to, to, to look at art and um, study things. Um, but when you see them, the painting style is so different than the sculptural style. And so it, it's, it's a very, um, to my 21st century eye, I can't, I can't synthesize them together. Um, I'm, I, you know, ho hopefully future audiences who are going to be taught all of this, they will be brought up in it, and they'll be like, "No, this is what this scul sculpture was supposed to look like." And then they, then they can under, they can decide if they really want to be interested in it or not. But, mm -hmm. but for me, yeah, the, the red, the way the eyes are painted. I mean, the, because the form is so delicate, and it seems to me the painting part. It's not just that the colors, I know a lot of people write about them as garish. I'm mm -hmm. not even so opposed to the actual color. John Gibson, the, the British artist that Harry Hosmer uh, apprenticed with, he had mm -hmm. a tinted Venus that he tinted. And, and in the 19th century, they were scandalized by it. Um, it was in a show at the, at the Metropolitan actually a few years ago. Um, but it's just that it's the flat color shapeness of it 
and it's just a really different level of um, style and refine. It, it, it almost seems in contrast to the refinement of the form that the sculptors were doing. I would, I mean, th I'm sure there's articles written about it. It's like, did the sculptors paint that or did somebody else paint that on somebody else's sculpture? I mean, working in unison, but usually the way, you know, at least in the 19th century, all, you saw all those um, um, assistants that, that Hosmer um, employed. You know, when you start at the beginning, you're just doing like, oh, let me just cut out some negative space. You have no skill. And then you, maybe you get good at the architectural elements, like a column. Maybe you get, get good at foliage. Someone else gets good at drapery. Someone else gets good at hands and faces, you know, and toes. Um, so I'm kind of figuring that different people painted those sculptures. So then, so then it's a collaboration. So then I don't know. I'm not, I'm not such a good collaborator on making my art. <laughs> Yeah, but I do like- Otherwise, like, you could've been, you know. I, I appreciate how you brought color into your sculptures, but through the different materials, right. um, which is a different way of doing it. Um, and, and it is beautiful. Um, so I have one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, let me find it here. Let's see. Are groups, collectives, researchers like you are there groups, collectors, and researchers like you that focus on making sure mo more influential female artists um, of history are getting more attention from museums? Who are they and how can we follow their research? Uh, you know, um, A, there's very few. Um, and, and this person is asking, wait a minute. No, I only see question three. Um, oh, no, here we are. Groups and collectives, okay. researchers like you that focus on making more of hmm. Yeah, it's, um, how do I say this? Um, I feel like until the people who are buying art, right? Who are still mostly men, there, there's, there's like one, two, I can think of three women that, that are, are, you know, no, four that are, you know, amassing collections of, of female artists. Um, only one of them collects me, the other three don't. Um, and it, it's an international, they're not all here in the United States, two here and two in Europe. Um, so if you think about the board of a museum and all of those trustees that have big art collections, if they're not buying women artists, how long do you think it's gonna take for that museum to actually do a show of women artists? It's gonna take a while. And yes, museums are trying and they all set up women's councils and this and that. And, you know, it's just, it's hard to get people mm -hmm. to pay for women's work. Yes. And if you don't see, I mean, and if, and if the, the board members are male and they're billionaires and let's put it this way, except for the Spanx lady, you know what I mean? The, the wife isn't going to be a billionaire on her own. Who's making those decisions? It's, 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 a terrible, it's a terrible reality that we're all trying to fight against. And um, I know, I wonder if that Spanx lady actually collects art. Someone should get to her. <laughs> we need another woman. Well, there can't only be two women in the entire United States that are amassing a woman's collection. Come on, like, it's I'm sure not. <laughs> and so, so I would like to think, I mean, there's lots of online, there's, you know, cancel art galleries and change the museums on Instagram and people are, obviously the Gorilla Girls have been trying forever, but that's a group of artists, you know, that's, that's great protest. Um, you know, how to affect real change, which is really at the, at the core of, the, of that person's question. You know, um, I'm trying my damnedest, that's all I can say. And, well, and I think the other part of that question is, is really looking at the pieces the, the successful artists of the past, you know, so, so you spoke of some of um, the female artists who really didn't get the credit that you're shedding light on. So that was the other part, like where can the general public go to, to find out more about some of those artists? And mm. okay, is there a place or a recommendation? Yeah. I mean, I don't think there is one place. Um, I mean, I mean, all right, there's, there's only two places in the United States. Um, there's the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC, that is not specifically a feminist museum. Um, 
Um, Mrs. Halliday started it. I mean, it's, it's still viable and very important and very necessary and needed. Um, and then there's the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art embedded at the Berkeley Museum. And they do have, you know, a, um, they have a council, of course, um, um, to, and I know they have a, a, what do you call it? Like a digital archive of feminist art. And so people can find feminist arts in, in that um, database. Um, but in terms of a, a group of individuals, researchers or collectives um, trying to change this, um, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to re remember the correct name, um, but there was a, a woman who was a benefactor. Um, and she loved Italy, she was based in Florence and she spent a lot of her um, um, money um, picking out different works of, of women artists from the Renaissance and restoring um, Plautilla, um, 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 oh, the nun, she was a Dominican nun. She did a, um, I mean, this is like late medieval, early Renaissance. She did a last supper and this woman and her, it was like a women's artist fund. I mean, I, I'm sure they still have an Instagram account. If, if, they, if, if you think of it, let us know, we'll post it. Yeah, but yeah. the problem is she just passed away in the last month and the entire organization folded. Oh, that's sad. You know? So that's what I mean, like, like, like the financial support is, is still incredibly necessary. So we either have to change the perception of, of women being experts, of being authors, of being authorities, you know, so that men will actually realize it and pay for the work, or we need more women to make a boatload more money so that they can buy what they want yeah. and support other women. And that's, that, yeah, that's all, I'm sorry, that's the best answer I have. <laughs> well, that was great. Thank you for answering the questions. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, so again, I wanna thank you for your time, for being with us and thank you to the Orlando Science Center for their contributions to uh, making tonight happen. Um, and if you have not already seen the Pompeii, the Immortal City at the Science Center, please go to osc.org forward slash Pompeii. Um, I wanna thank the staff, Ani, for being in charge of the, the, uh, the presentation from the back end. Thank you so much for helping to make tonight possible. And thank you to, again, Orlando Science Center and Orange County Government Arts and Cultural Affairs for supporting Pompeii and the related programs. Stay connected with us through social media. You can check us out on Downtown Arts District on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and our website, and also City Arts for, for future programming. Uh, thank you again, be safe and join us in the future, come see us when you get a chance and uh, keep creating Orlando. Tonight's been great. We appreciate you all. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.